Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is one of the eight things the charter uh, requires the city manager to do, so I appreciate you helping me uh, accomplish my goals as the city manager. Uh, this year, uh, the budget message that I have prepared is uh, uh, a little bit different than previous years. It's got a little bit more bad news uh, than previous years. I'll, I'll overview that today. Uh, but I'm also very proud of what we've been able to do to overcome our obstacles. So I'll highlight the challenges we had, how we overcame them, and then what the budget uh, uh, can tell us, uh, overview. And then we'll, of course, take questions afterward. I hope by now it is no secret that we have a general fund revenue problem. Spend a little time on this. Uh, we, many decades ago, made a very good decision, very smart decision. We, the city government, decided to focus uh, on a move away from property tax toward sales tax. Now, at the time, there was no internet and no tax-free status for companies that sell goods on the internet. And so at that time, that was a very smart thing to do. Columbia is a nexus of retail uh, economy, retail shopping. People drive here to shop. And uh, what that really created was a scenario where half of the cost of the services we provide was paid for by visitors. That's pretty smart. And uh, it really lowered the taxes in Columbia to the point where we are one of the lowest tax cities in the state of Missouri, which is one of the lowest tax states in the country. Uh, so in terms of the burden of government, uh, we are very light touch uh, if you compare us to other places. Unfortunately, the world has changed, and the internet is now in place, and uh, the federal government uh, created a tax incentive for online retailers to try to create that industry try to cultivate it, incubate that industry. And it has worked very well. Uh, <laughs> uh, interesting news this morning. Uh, Amazon is now so, uh, so dominating in that industry that uh, uh, there is a new stock index called the Amazon Death Watch Stock Index. 54 different retailers merged together in an index. And you know what that index has done. It has dropped precipitously over the last five years. Amazon stock uh, has just gone through the roof. This morning, Sears announced that they are going to become a fulfillment center for Amazon. So that's their strategy, to avoid closing every store in the country, which is what the CEO hinted at in March, he, he said to all stockholders he doubted very much that they could survive this year. So they have made a deal with Amazon. They're going to act as their warehouse uh, all over the country. Now the nice part is you'll finally be able to buy Kenmore appliances through Amazon. Uh, and so while that's good news for Sears, in fact their stock price is up by double digits today, uh, it still does not produce sales tax for those of us who rely on it. The difficulty with that, of course, is we are a bit of a canary in a coal mine as a city. We're so focused on it. But cities all over America aren't the same as us. Some are equally dependent. Many are not. Some, it's just part of their revenue portfolio, and some don't use it at all. And so when we go to Washington, D.C., as Mayor Treese and I did recently, uh, there's not a large group of cities explaining what this problem is and that it's a big problem for us. It's a small group of cities that are particularly harmed. So we will continue to communicate our general fund revenue problem uh, as much as we can, but I do not believe we can look to the federal government to solve this problem, to stop this massive subsidy of Amazon and other online retailers. Now, it hurts us most in the general fund, but if you think about all of our revenue streams, it's all sales tax, right? We use sales tax to fund the airport, transit, streets, sidewalks, parks, and oh yes, police and fire 
and the city council and the city manager's office and the clerk's office. And every department of the city has some sort of sales tax revenue except the utilities where you have rate payers instead. So I can't, uh, I can't exaggerate the uh, difficulty we're having. We have a severe revenue problem. The general fund budget for FY18 is recommended to be $83 million, a little over $83 million. Uh, and what that represents is a 0.8% reduction in expenditures and 1.4% reduction in general fund revenues. Now, the troubling thing with this is uh, expenses are going up. Things cost more. And so when we have to cut like this, it's, uh, it's painful. We have made a significant amount of painful cuts, and I'll overview some of them, just to balance the budget. We're going to talk about some of the obstacles we have here. Now, if you move away from the general fund, you take the city's budget in its entirety. So add all the utilities into the mix. Uh, our total spend is $455 million. That's actually down by 0.4%. Total revenues are up by 1.4%. That's not in the general fund, right? That's outside the general fund. So that's the total city picture. Uh, I did have four goals when we started creating the budget. Uh, it's my job to draft the budget, to, to recommend one to the city council. Then the city council's difficult work is to take the next two months and slog through that document and, uh, and make it reflect uh, what they're hearing from the community uh, for our our, uh, our, our strategic plan choices, et cetera. So one goal is always, of course, to balance the general fund. Uh, utilities and other types of funds, they don't necessarily have to balance. If you think about the uh, capital improvement sales tax, for example, another sales tax, right? All of our capital improvements. Uh, we save money each year. We don't get enough to do all the projects, so we save it up over time, and then we'll have a big spend in one year. And so it's very common for those funds to spend more than they're receiving in a particular year. And that's okay because it's a project. Save up the money and then spend it. In the general fund, this is really our operating budget of the city. Now, every fund has an operating budget. But this one, it must balance. And so... Uh, that is obviously one of our goals every year. A goal I had was to avoid layoffs. I know, and I knew going into this, we're going to have a, a pretty tough year financially. Revenues are not coming in, and expenses are up in two key areas that I'll, that I'll talk about. But layoffs are the most painful way to balance a budget, and you don't have to talk to too many people at Mizzou to hear that. They are extremely painful. For two reasons. One, it's, it's cruel on a personal level, right? But two, when you take a person who is earning a paycheck and remove them from your, from your organization, you're accelerating the economic damage, right? And uh, now sometimes you're in straits where you simply cannot avoid it, and you must do that. And uh, I don't criticize Mizzou at all for that. You, sometimes you must. It's the only way to cut the spend quickly enough. In this case, I wanted to do what we could to avoid that fate, to, to cut other things where we could, to reduce spend in other ways, to avoid layoffs of any full-time employees. As crazy as it sounds, I did want to try to recognize that every single one of our employees deserves some sort of monetary recognition for their year's worth of work, uh, knowing that there's no new money, right? There's no growth in revenue. Uh, so how do we do a raise? And uh, I'll get to the bottom of this shortly, but there isn't one, but we have an idea. So that was a goal, to have some sort of monetary compensation for employees. And of course, the overriding goal is we want to implement the city council's strategic plan. Uh, we're bought in. We want to do this, and we wanted to find a way in the budget where we could keep our uh, progress happening and, and bake that even farther into our DNA as an organization. Okay, those are the four goals. Here are the challenges. We talked about low sales tax growth. So for the, the last four years, really, we have seen historically low sales tax growth. 
So in our history, you know, we've, we've had a, a really uh, sort of blessed existence. We'd have years with 8% more money than we had the year before. We'd have years with 6 5%. We never had less than 5% if you look in history. Uh, 3% was an incredibly conservative number that we would use in the budget, 3% more revenue. In the last four years, we've not seen 3%. It's been two, it's been less than two, two, and four. FY18, our best estimate is we will see uh, maybe 1% growth there, so we have assumed that. We've challenged that about three times as reports were released from the Department of Revenue that had painted much worse a <laughs> picture than this. Uh, but as we get more and more information as the year goes on, we, we do feel confident that uh, the 1% is something we will see. Unfortunately, uh, health care costs uh, will, are up in 17 by $650,000. So just to balance the budget, uh, we've had to cut a million and six hundred and fifty thousand dollars of our of our uh, bar we have to jump over comes from health care cost increases worse than that is the pension cost increases so we have four pensions uh, in general uh, four types of pension uh, 1.3 million dollars is the increase in cost this year in the, of those pensions uh, one million of that 1.3 is in police and fire. And transit, finally, uh, it continues to exceed revenues, the expenditures in that service, by 600,000. We're, we're in a year, and you'll see what we're recommending to try to solve these th four problems uh, here in a minute. Uh, we're in a year where there's no other fund that can bail out transit at this point, and it's burning through cash. So we have to we have to address that. So three big negative cost increases, and uh, uh, the revenue is not going to solve our problem. You can see the numbers there. One percent increase is a little over two hundred thousand, and we're talking about two point six million, roughly in cost increases. Here's a chart of our sales tax growth. Um, you can see 08 and 09, that was the Great Recession, right? That was the one time our sales tax has not been what you see in 11, right? 5.8%. 2011, that's a very normal year for our history. Uh, but then as more and more sales occur online, you can see it trailing off. And this is due almost entirely to online sales. So how did we solve these uh, problems? Well, we're going to continue uh, a technique we had uh, two years ago and last year. We have not budgeted for any replacement of our fleet. We're going to push our fleet yet again one more year. This may be the last year we were able to do that. You, you know, they are machines, and they are going to wear out. And uh, so we uh, haven't replaced them, and uh, we're, we can't do it uh, this year either. We are going to continue our 45-day hiring delay. Uh, we have that as a rule in all departments except police and fire and the utilities. So the delay, what it is, is when uh, someone parts uh, employment with the city, uh, the HR department will uh, wait for the request to fill that job. They will hold that in a file for 45 days. 45 days later, they will pick it up and start the recruitment process. It's a painful technique uh, for all of our program managers, everyone who works, right? If you, especially if you're in a small department, uh, everybody has to pick up more work or you have to decide to simply do less. And that's never a very popular answer, especially if you're in the public and the government says, no, we're not going to do that this month, right? Uh, it's a painful technique. However, it's, it causes less harm than many other budget cut techniques would do. So we are proposing to continue that. I did ask departments, uh, the, the back office departments, to uh, identify 10% budget cuts. Those three departments were IT, community relations, and the building maintenance custodial uh, office. They uh, were 
wonderful. They did come up with those cuts. We didn't have to take every single one of them, uh, but we did take almost every single one of them. <laughs> and it came up with budget cuts of 1.1 million. So the short uh, answer to all this is we've cut over a million dollars out of the budget so that we could pay for the pension increases in police and fire. The health costs we solve a different way, the transit costs we solve a different way. But this is what enabled us to pay the increased costs of police and fire pensions. And I just want to point out a minute, one million dollar increase in one year, that's 10 police officers we're adding but we don't get any officers, right? So pension is a really, uh, can be a really huge problem. Now we have a fix and it is very slowly working. And uh, unfortunately this spike happened because we did have to adjust our assumptions. We're not earning the income off of our investments that we had hoped. And that's been true nationwide. We're not special with that. So well, we had to reduce our assumptions. We don't expect we're going to earn 7.5% on our investments the way we had assumed. So we lowered that to 7, 7%, which seems pretty, uh, it seems achievable as we study the, the market. So I, I share all that with you to tell you that I hope, it's my hope, that this is a one-year increase. Now, it's a permanent increase, or not permanent, it's, it's uh, what, a, 60 year increase, uh, but it's, uh, uh, I, I, my hope is it will not spike again next year. Now here's the exciting thing. We also got creative and uh, we figured out a way to add four positions to the police department. We're doing this through an ongoing effort, we've done it a couple times before, to civilianize jobs that do not need police powers. So what, what you see when you're shrinking as a government relative to your city, <laughs> and that's certainly what we are doing all over the city, and it's also true in the police department, uh, you start having folks do stuff that you normally would have a civilian do, right? So I see Deputy Chief back there nodding her head, yes. Uh, so we have ended up having sworn personnel doing things that don't require police powers. And uh, so our effort here, uh, because a civilian costs literally half what a police officer costs, we can add a job at, at half the cost and, and move that sworn officer back to a job that requires police powers. So by doing that, we've managed to do four this year. I do want to talk about some positives we have. <laughs> there are some. Uh, we are, we are a very uh, tightly run ship when it comes to our finances. The council for decades has made difficult choices to keep us within our means. And because of that, we have very strong bond ratings, AA+. Plus. Uh, I will share with you, I don't know how much longer we can r see that. I, I do believe as we move forward, those will go down, and not from any action of our own, but for the whole economy. Municipal bonds are becoming less and less attractive in the marketplace. So uh, we uh, also have a goal each year to try to keep our utility rate increases to a $5 or less total average increase. So I'm very pleased by our performance this year in this budget. We do have increases in the utilities. Uh, some are voter approved increases and some are simply operating cost increases. And uh, we've managed to keep the total average increase to $3.83, so I'm very proud of that. We've come in way under our $5 uh, goal. Of our four pension plans, two of them are healthy, right? Two of them are over the 80% mark uh, that we shoot for, uh, that is, the industry defines as healthy. So we're not too worried about those. Uh, we are still uh, playing catch up on the police and fire pensions. We have continued erosion of sales tax revenue. I won't go through uh, my initial speech again. It's a real problem. Every time we buy something online, we defund most of the city government. Now, uh, because that's our major problem, I have recommended three things in the next year for the council to consider that would begin to change our fate, it would take our own fate in our own hands and if we recognize that 
well, the federal government's probably not going to solve our problem, uh, then what do we do? Uh, my first recommendation is we really should think about putting a use tax on the ballot. You've heard already we have had conversations with our county counterparts that uh, perhaps if we put it on at the same time as we did last year with the uh, vehicle licensing tax, uh, it could be very helpful to go at the same time because we ha both have the same education uh, efforts and then uh, uh, we get sort of the maximum use of our efforts there. So the use tax, uh, very briefly, um, is a, it fills the gap uh, where we as humans and, and business owners make our interest, our self-interested decisions to avoid tax where we can, right? So uh, take, uh, if I'm gonna build a $20 million building downtown, if there's something I can do to avoid the sales tax, I get to save eight, nine percent on my building cost. So these are rational, uh, economically minded people, and so they make that choice. And what that means is they don't buy products, lumber, steel, concrete, in Missouri. They buy it straight from China, from a port in Tacoma or New Orleans or New York, and they avoid, you know, roughly nine percent of the cost to build their building. And that's sales tax we don't receive. Uh, that's true every time any of us buys a book online, right? Now, it's an incredibly convenient thing. I love it too. But uh, unfortunately, the, the unintended consequence is we are defunding the city government through that choice. So the use tax, what it does is say, all right, you can't avoid the sales tax. Now, you either pay the sales tax or you pay the use tax. It's the exact same number, exact same amount that gets charged, and uh, you either pay one or the other, but not both. You're not paying double. You're just paying the sales tax on what you would have paid it for if you had shopped locally. So I, I believe the use tax has uh, got two benefits. One is, of course, it would uh, help our revenue uh, to a certain degree, even if the federal government doesn't uh, end the practice of subsidizing Amazon and other online retailers. Uh, but it also creates this incentive to shop local. If I can't avoid the tax, maybe I'll buy my lumber right here in town instead of having to wait for it to come from China, right? So there are a lot of benefits for our economy to this, this approach. So I will be recommending uh, the use tax uh, very quickly uh, to, if we're going to put it on the November ballot, unfortunately, well, we have to uh, do that next month. So I'll be uh, uh, placing that on the agenda for council's consideration next month. And uh, uh, we'll see uh, how that turns out. I'm also recommending, in addition to the use tax, that we study our retail economy. We should ask a few questions, get, get the answers to a few questions, in my view. One question is, what industries do well, compete well against the internet? And two, what are the stores we all leave Columbia for to go shop at? <laughs> right, that's called retail leakage. And uh, maybe if we knew that answer, we could share that with all of our retailers. They could add the products to their store that we are all driving away to go buy. Or uh, we could attract one of those retailers to come to town that we're all driving to go buy. So these are simple kind of questions about an economy that right now we just don't know the answer to. And so I've recommended that we do a study with partners uh, if we can. And then of course the great benefit of the city government doing that is all, it becomes public. It's public information. The results can be shared with everyone who's in that industry. And then finally of course, uh, if the sales tax is a sinking ship, ever reducing amount of income, we really shouldn't double down on that as a revenue source. Uh, so I am recommending we look toward the property tax for future ballots. Uh, now public safety and roads especially have a connection with property. And uh, so it makes sense to have a property tax to do that. And uh, uh, I believe our public safety needs are greater at this point than our road needs. Although both of them are the number one and two choice when you when we survey our citizens uh, those always come in one and two is where citizens want us to spend more money than we do today 
I'm going to follow the rest of this through the uh, strategic plan lens. So uh, as we look at our economy goals, we've come to realize jobs are social equity. You can't really achieve social equity without economic equity, without jobs, jobs that pay a living wage. So this budget does have uh, a continuation of our effort at growing disadvantaged business enterprises, that's the DBE, and small business focus. We want to have a robust startup uh, service, and, and I think we're growing that. It's, it's really uh, kind of amazing if you can get over to the hub and see what the Economic Development Department's doing there. Obviously, the airport is an economic uh, driver. Uh, very happy about the progress we're making there. We have new air service, new air service providers, and uh, of course, I think everyone's heard of the new destination, uh, Denver, which starts in August. Uh, for the social equity piece, for implementing the strategic plan, I am recommending this list of expenditures. Uh, and uh, this will, uh, if it's funded, uh, this comes from the city council's half of the incentive-based budgeting savings that we realized in 2016. So I'll have another list here in a bit, but I wanted to give the detail of what we believe advances the strategic plan as, uh, as written and the pieces we haven't been able to finish yet. Uh, so for example, one of the uh, amazing things we've been able to do, the city council started the uh, housing community land trust. And this is really exciting to me because uh, m take all of the affordable housing programs we have, and they have varying degrees of effectiveness, but most do a pretty good job at creating affordable housing one time. Uh, but then once the house is created, it's affordable. Uh, let's say I was able to buy that house. I benefit from that subsidy to make it affordable. But if I decide to sell uh, my own self-interest, I'm going to sell at market rate, right? So it's not affordable ever again. It's always at market rate. So what the Community Land Trust does through a fairly complex system, but it, it works very well, is it, it keeps the land but the house sells. So the owner can take equity out of the house that as it grows in value, but the land stays in the trust. And so uh, it makes it through uh, a fairly complex system, it stays affordable long term, uh, not just one time. So pretty exciting uh, innovation there. The first time we funded it was with uh, savings from 2014, we put $200,000 aside to build four cottage-style houses that were close to net zero energy, uh, energy efficient, on Lynn Street. And we've broken ground on that. It's a pretty exciting achievement. What I'm recommending here is let's do it again. We have savings from uh, 16. This would build four more uh, in community land trust. I'll walk through the rest of this very briefly. Uh, we need about 35 grand to do a climate assessment implementation, which uh, council has recently talked about. 10,000 for our marketing, communications, printing as we go and have conversations in the neighborhoods. Uh, to get people to these meetings, something we've learned is, is the secret sauce, <laughs> right? You have to feed them and you have to take care of the kids so they can focus, right? You do those two things, we have a much better chance of having a really powerful meeting. And, and I know that Councilmember Scal has been at a couple of those where, I mean, these have been amazing compared to uh, not doing those techniques. So this is one of the things we want to continue. <coughs> Food, uh, Public Works has a STEM initiative that's uh, very much a strategic plan effort. This is about getting uh, bright kids who, who may have uh, uh, maybe at risk of not graduating high school, for example, into the engineering field by giving them uh, internships and exposure to, to the work. Community scholars, I think, uh, is, uh, is well known. Step up to leadership is something we partner with the Central Missouri Community Action Agency for. This is their training that we provide to the neighborhoods we are focused on where there might be a lack of traditional neighborhood leadership. 
And so uh, our plan can only work if those folks step up and really keep it going. And this is an effort to teach them how to do that. Uh, and you see the rest there. One important one is supplier diversity contract. This is our way to keep the efforts that Jim Witt has started going for one more year. Uh, so if we use the savings from 16, we can keep his services for one more year. There's some incredible stories about what he's been able to accomplish, uh, not the least of which is to help someone returning from prison get a business license after they'd been rejected. And that person now is a very successful owner of a, of a gym. It's pretty cool. One of the other uh, stories I love about the strategic plan and on all those meetings uh, you know, you think, well, a meeting, what is that, you know, is that, what does that really do? One of the ideas that came out of those meetings uh, and from city staff was maybe if we had a, a partner that would sponsor a scholarship, a, uh, a grant, we could encourage local folks, local kids to uh, do something meaningful for the neighborhood and then we'd have a partner pay a thousand dollars maybe for their education and uh, you try to target to someone who may not have been able to go to college otherwise well that's happened and this is uh, a picture of Micaiah Thompson who uh, as a project conducted something as simple as a neighborhood party in Indian Hills Park but think about that right so a lot of neighborhoods that we're focused on with this plan people don't really get out and meet each other you don't even know who the neighbor is, right? Uh, I've lived in neighborhoods like that, and uh, there's not a sense of community. There isn't a community. Uh, but when we get out and meet each other, know each other, help one another through uh, life, uh, community happens, and it's this really tight bond that, uh, that really moves the whole community forward. Everything gets better. Crime goes down, right? People help each other. So she decided to do this to help create one event where at least that day we could make connections between neighbors. So uh, she was successful in achieving that grant. Shelter insurance funds this program. And uh, not only did she get that $1,000, she can renew that scholarship for up to four years. And I believe she gets to go anywhere she wants to with that. Yeah. So tremendous success story from the strategic plan with external partners. We're gonna to continue to try to do that. I have gone on at some length about community policing in the State of the City address. I hope you can watch that if you, if you missed it. It's online, you can watch the video link. It's incredibly powerful. The point is, if you look at the first year of our community policing efforts in our strategic neighborhood uh, areas, crime is trending down in those strategic plan neighborhoods, down statistically significantly, double digits down. That's not true citywide. So something's different, and I will tell you, it's community policing that's making that difference. We are gonna invest in a new North Police Station. That project total is 9.7 million. It's in process. Uh, we've got the land, we've are started our design phase, and uh, that will go a long way to increasing our crime prevention efforts and our policing efforts uh, on the north. Uh, for the first time, we will have more than just the headquarters over here. And of course, uh, we ha as you know, we've been talking a great deal about a public safety ballot, a property tax based. Uh, in FY18, I will be recommending that to council. Uh, most likely after an engagement process, we will see how that works. They are not necessarily connected, but one certainly informs the other. Flip to infrastructure, we are going to need to do a water ballot after our public safety ballot. Uh, first things first, right? But uh, it's that time. We have some infrastructure needs there. We'll have a list of projects and we'll put forward a ballot initiative in 2018. Uh, streets and sidewalks, uh, we did cut funding last year to create police officers, uh, but it is obviously a high citizen priority. We still have a major investment in that infrastructure. It's over a $7 million budget. Now transit, I mentioned earlier that it's burning about $600,000 of cash a year. We can't, we can't go another year with that. We don't have that much cash left 
in the fund. So uh, we've gone through the Olson study. It has done a good job identifying routes uh, that have extremely low usage. So what I am recommending for council to consider, and uh, there are any number of ways to uh, get to this outcome, but is uh, rather than creating flex routes, which Olson kind of talked about, is to simply eliminate the three routes that have the very low ridership. Now, that's painful in one respect, but I, I believe in the future things will get better and we can grow back into it, but we have to do something about our expenditures, and so I will be recommending we, we just eliminate those routes and not do the flex routes. Uh, our most expensive service in transit is paratransit. It costs something like $38 a ride, and we uh, collect uh, $3, I think. Is that right? Two, thank you. So we're recommending increasing that by a dollar. Uh, that, that combined with the elimination of the routes will um, get us to the point where we uh, can make it one more year in transit. It doesn't solve our problem. It doesn't get the fund into a healthy status, but it does get us one more year. Uh, and it seems like a good time to rebrand. Uh, if you're going to have a different system, a different footprint, uh, we should uh, we should call it something different. We have uh, also you know a ongoing um, uh, I don't know if you call it a conflict, but we have a fellow organization with the same name, Como Connect, and uh, they have asked us to change our name, and we're of course willing to do that. Uh, and it seems like a good time to do it now. So that's going to be our new brand, Go Como, Columbia's public transit. Uh, I'm amazed at how many ideas we had that were already taken <laughs> and copyrighted and trademarked and websites are gone. So this one worked. And uh, so we're going to be calling it GoComo. Now when we talk about operational excellence, the fifth part of the strategic plan, uh, I do have to point out we have incredible employees. Uh, the community has a 70% satisfaction rate with the service they receive from city employees. That's 20 points higher than any other city we can find. It's 20 points higher than the national average or the region. I'm really proud of the work we do as a group. And uh, the picture there, uh, that's our manager of the contact center, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. She's amazing. Uh, this is our logo for the contact center. We're going to have a full launch this year in FY 2018. We've been soft launch for a couple of years. We're now reached a point where we can uh, go full bore marketing that. Mayor Treese asked us to accelerate our efforts. We've done that. And so uh, you can memorize this number if you like, 874-CITY. 874-CITY. If you have any question about city government, call that number. They can help you. The vast majority of calls are handled with one call. You don't get transferred. Our goal is to answer your question or get you the service you need that first time. And the beautiful part, we actually have people who answer. It's not an answering machine. You don't have to press any more buttons. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I love that service. And everyone that uses it loves it. So uh, I, I, th this is operational excellence, the contact center. I do need to talk about how we're treating our employees, right? You can't have operational excellence without great employees who are motivated and engaged. The great part is we're bought in. We are in on the strategic plan and we're making progress. But without revenue, I can't, I can't uh, afford a pay raise. And so there is not one recommended in this budget. Uh, that's a pretty long streak of very low or no raises for employees. We're reaching the 10-year mark on very low compensation increases. We're falling pretty far behind uh, the private sector and other cities. I'm beginning to worry more and more about this great staff and how engaged they are. Even the best of us get a little tired. And if there's never a raise, uh, I you know, the next time someone tries to poach me, you know, that's pretty attractive. So uh, I am recommending uh, for the city council's use of their half 
of the incentive-based budgeting that they fund a one-time payment to employees of $1,000 each. So it's not a permanent pay increase. It doesn't increase the base pay or our obligations in perpetuity. But it's a one-time payment to really uh, just say thank you for this hard work and to recognize that we can't afford an actual raise, but here's something. Uh, the nice part is it's savings. So uh, it doesn't, I don't have to cut the budget to create this. And uh, that's part of the recommendations I will have for council uh, in this budget for the use of that savings. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, you'll remember this thing we created about five years ago called incentive-based budgeting. Uh, in 2016, we saved $4.4 million. We tightened our belt and we came in under budget, so the budget would have allowed us to spend $4.4 million more than we did spend. So our, our process is to have 50% of that go back to the departments that created the savings, and then 50% stays with the city council for their use. Uh, our practice has been that in the budget process, then I recommend uh, the use of those funds. And the council has felt very free to change that, as they should. It's their funding. Uh, but here's the list that I came up with and, uh, and think would be useful. Again, this $1,000 for each employee would be about $1.1 million of that uh, $2.2 million that, that becomes available. 350000 to be used to implement the strategic plan. I itemized those earlier in the slideshow. 250000 to use as matching funds for one of our key strategic plan partners, Job Point. They have an opportunity to buy their facility, uh, and this would simply be a uh, help in their fundraising to do that. Uh, we would actually buy a service from them to, uh, to do that. Uh, it gives them long-term sustainability as an organization if they can uh, get out of paying rent every month, right? Uh, I've also uh, recommended the use of 150000 to assist in the Phase two expansion of the Missouri Innovation Center. Uh, we helped create the Missouri Innovation Center with a $150,000 investment in the past. This is the incubator over near the research reactor. It's incredibly successful. It is full, and the problem they're having now is once those companies outgrow the space, they leave Columbia. They go to St. Louis, where there is a lot of spec space that they can grow into. We don't have that kind of space in Columbia. So the, the idea here is that they would expand, they'd create a phase two, bigger spaces, more square footage. So when the companies grow, they can move on site, stay in Columbia. I watched a, a company leave uh, two years ago, owned by two PhD professors from Mizzou who developed some amazing technology. They had spent 10 years teaching here. They developed the technology. They started the company. We helped them with the Innovation Center. They had children in the school system. They were really invested in the community. They loved Columbia. Uh, they left because they couldn't find space. And they're, they're now living in St. Louis. That's what uh, the phase two expansion is intended to stop, and this would be a uh, contribution to that. Uh, Vision Zero is an initiative the council passed uh, unanimously earlier this year. Uh, I'm recommending we use 100,000 to help implement that vision. That's uh, for zero pedestrian and, uh, well, any deaths related to transportation on our street network. Uh, and then $50,000, if you remember, um, Chair of the Disabilities Commission, Chuck Graham, came in and asked for some help to try, a, try an idea to get uh, local cab companies to buy significantly better equipment that would be, uh, that would enable folks in wheelchairs to be able to get a cab. And so uh, I'm happy to recommend $50,000 for that purpose. And that leaves 200000 on the table. And so what I'm recommending is, uh, you know, you could pay down the police and fire pension liabilities if you chose to. Now, uh, that's a tiny amount of money compared to the liability. There's 103 million left, so, you know, that's just where my brain put it that day that I drafted this. 
So finally, uh, let me try to close with, uh, we're looking at some incredibly lean years ahead. Uh, we're gonna have to change how we've always done things. We're gonna have to communicate to the public that our service levels are going to be slower as we delay hiring, as we don't replace the fleet, as we cut a million dollars out of, of our operation. One of the things we cut were five vacant jobs spread across uh, building maintenance and custodial. So all of us internally, we city employees, we've accepted lower service levels, right? The trash builds up more. The vacuuming doesn't happen on the same schedule. Uh, the kitchen isn't cleaned the way it used to be. But those are incredible folks that are left. I have to tell you, if, you're, if you've been in this building at all, they make us all proud to work here. They do an incredible job keeping it a beautiful. But that's the kind of thing we have to do. We're gonna have to communicate those service lines that are going to suffer from the cuts that we're experiencing and from the lack of growth. I will just share with you, there are going to be four opportunities to say what you think about this budget and to provide uh, input and ideas to the city council. The first one is going to happen on August 21st. That is the city council's first public hearing at their council meeting. They'll have an all day session that Wednesday on August 23rd here in this room. Uh, and then two more meetings, September 5th and September 18th are also public hearings. The September 18th meeting is the one where the council will adopt the budget if they have reached a, a level of comfort with, with the existing uh, budget. We will have an amendment sheet, you know, that we start right, you know, pretty much in the first meeting, and uh, that will we will add things as they change uh, to that. So you want to keep an eye on the amendment sheet for the budget. That's my speech. So uh, uh, thank you for uh, your patience and for listening to some things that uh, are hard to hear, but uh, are the facts. So uh, I'm proud we've been able to overcome these uh, these big spending holes we have. I wish we wouldn't have to do this, but we've taken the least painful way to pay for those cost increases that we could find. With that, let me stop and take some water and uh, ask for any questions the, the press may have. Not at this point. Um, so the question was, do we know how much we would ask for in the ballots that are coming? Uh, and the short answer is not yet. <laughs> uh, one is it's an ongoing conversation about how much is needed for, for each thing. So water is easier, right? Because there's, it's a knowable expense, right? How, how much does pipe cost and what projects need to have? It gets tougher when you talk about service levels like policing. That's a public conversation that has to happen, and until we get through that um, at the council level, I won't know the rate that we'd have to charge to pay for the service level that's defined. Uh, now that's calculable, and we will when we get there. But uh, my point in bringing it up here is just to uh, let you know that I will be recommending that we do something, do a ballot in the coming year. And then we will be working on it as a staff. Yes. Do sure. the four officers returning to the street fill four of the dozen or so at last check openings that are at the police department right now? No, these, uh, thanks for asking. So the question was, do the four officers in the police department, uh, will they just fill some of the vacancies we have? The answer is no, these are, these will be added roles. So an increase in, in our effective strength. So, uh, I think the last time I checked, we had 17 uh, openings in the department, 10 of which were in the process of background checks and whatnot. So that leaves about seven, I think, that we're, what we're focused on next. And I yes. have a follow up to that. Okay. So, as you say, the seven that you're focused on next. So, what's the strategy to attract those qualified applicants to those positions? 
Well, we have quite a few. Um, you know, one of the most effective strategies is for our current officers to uh, go uh, try to recruit folks they've met that are particularly impressive. Uh, so we do that, and a lot of our folks that apply come from that network uh, uh, where we've met folks that are, that are really quite good. Uh, we, we don't have a problem really attracting people. We have far more people apply than we can hire, uh, but we do have a very strict uh, hiring uh, rubric, you might say. So, for example, one thing we do that many departments don't, we require uh, the equivalent of an associate's degree of college before you can apply. That's not the industry standard. Uh, it's a higher level standard. So one thing we're talking about is uh, potentially reducing that, maybe just accepting a high school diploma like so many other uh, police departments. What that really does is enable us to capture uh, veterans returning from Afghanistan, say, uh, who don't have the, the uh, college but are clearly experienced and capable and would become great students in the academy, right? Uh, or uh, officers from other departments, as a great example, from around Missouri. Right now, we have a barrier that keeps them from applying. And so we're talking about, well, maybe we, maybe we try that, see what happens. Uh, we're a little reluctant just because uh, we do feel like college is a good thing for all, everyone. To, it helps your thinking skills, your communication skills, your ability to, to uh, uh, act in a diverse setting. So uh, we're, that's an idea we're going to explore. Okay. I hope you would. <laughs> um, so when you say that, uh, and I knew this already, but current officers or officers that have retired are some of the best tools for recruitment, but when it's common knowledge that there is a morale problem in the Columbia Police Department, does that then play into officers maybe telling other officers not to apply to the Columbia Police Department? You know, I think that's happened once or twice, uh, but I don't think it's a widespread thing. Uh, it's still a great job. You know, you compare what we pay and the pension and what you get to do and the impact you have on the community, we attract some great applicants. So we don't have trouble attracting applicants. Uh, once again, you know, we have hundreds more than we can hire when we, when we go through a year-long process. It does take a long time to get them on. Uh, so, no, I think we have far more positive contacts and negatives. And frankly, you know, morale is an issue citywide. It's becoming more of an issue citywide as we go through what is now 10 years of very little increase in pay. So, uh, you know, where I sit traditionally, you want uh, high morale, a raise would go a long way for that, right? Other questions? Councilmember Scala. Well, actually, um, if I remember, we, we were in the same meeting just now, and I, I took it the opposite way. I, maybe I misread. I, so I shouldn't speculate, but I took it that it was a sales tax that they had used, you know, 20 years ago to lower property, to replace property tax funding. But I might have that wrong, so let me, let me punt on that one. Maybe you know this, or maybe you find out, but just how much property, by way of clarification, um, that's a, I haven't thought of that recently. It's, uh, our last request was uh, to try to create a $5 million revenue each year, and that would have required 30 cents on the property tax. Right now, our total is 41 cents. Uh, it's a little bit more than the library charges. So I'd like to keep that in perspective and thank Councilmember Trapp for making that observation. Uh, it's true and it's probably shocking that the city government doesn't charge much more than the library does in property tax. So uh, when I say we're a very low tax 
city, that's what I'm talking about. In fact, uh, I can't find a city that charges lower property tax in the city of Columbia, uh, except one, and they don't have, it's a very tiny town, and they don't have a police department. Yeah. Uh, let me go with Megan and then back up to Kate. Uh, can you be more specific about the department budget cuts? You mentioned not filling vacant positions. What else contributed to that? Uh, the, the largest, so the question was, uh, can you flesh out those three departments that had uh, budget cuts, uh, more than the five. So the five positions were in uh, building maintenance and custodial. We had uh, uh, the largest piece of that million dollars was actually in the IT department. And so they found ways to stop um, paying for some software that we had planned to stop using but hadn't stopped yet, but we're, we're just not going to buy it again next year. And we're, it, it, it takes some effort to get off of it. So it's we have to reorganize some of what we're working on to get there quicker. Uh, and uh, just equipment we're not going to we're not going to buy, uh, frankly. And then, um, largely in uh, community relations, uh, help me, Steve. What was it? Travel. Travel. Publication. Basically, every non-person line item, right? We shaved uh, everything. Uh, and those uh, are difficult cuts. Those are departments we hadn't cut before, so that it was their turn, unfortunately. They drew the short straw this year. Uh, I want to stress, you know, we've been on a budget cut approach for quite a while. I think uh, I've only had a two, two years in my career. I haven't had to cut the budget. Both of them have been here in Columbia. So uh, I feel it was really nice. It felt great not to have to cut the budget, but uh, we're not there anymore. Uh, the retail study, you mentioned it um, before, you mentioned it today, um, maybe discuss it for like a minute. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like, what are the goals you have for that? And I guess, what does a study like that look like, and what can the state government really do once the study is done? So, the question is uh, talk more about the retail study, uh, what can it really do, and uh, what's it look like, and what can we do with it when it's, when it's finished? Uh, one, is we, we get to learn about the economy itself. We, we rely almost completely on retail transactions as an organization, as a government. And we really uh, have blinders on right now. We don't know what to expect next year. We don't know what's uh, the strong part of that industry. Uh, in fact, and for good reason, our economic development efforts uh, say, if you look at the Economic Development Department literature, it says, you know, we're not going to incentivize retail. That's, retail is not what we're going to focus on. And that's because they want uh, living wage jobs. And retail tends not to do that. They don't tend to have the same benefits or pay. So uh, it's really a, an unknown thing. It's a black box to us at this point. And what I'd like to do is I think it's powerful to learn more about how it works and what's happening to it and what's going to happen next to, to the best know of the future. If we have that, we might be in a position to make a decision that would control our own fate. One thing I can think of now is, you know, because we would do it, it would be public, and that's a, that's a powerful thing, right? We would share that with all of the property owners, commercial property owners in town, and it might help them, one, avoid recruiting someone to their space that isn't going to compete well with the internet. Uh, but two, it helps them target those things they know we buy as a community, but we just don't buy here. Uh, so I think it's a powerful tool. We can help ourselves, help our economy and the government at the same time, is my hope. But we've never done it before, so I will tell you that's speculation on my part. I think that's how it would work. And it's not terribly expensive compared to, well, many other things. Anything else? Okay, one more. Uh, the contract center? Full yes. Launch. Uh, you mentioned that it's not an answering machine. Um, and I know when the city moved a lot of numbers over, um, there were some issues with people calling and get an answering machine. It's hard to get somebody on the phone. So when you're moving all the numbers over, Contact center, do you have a full staff contact center or do you have a plan in place to 
what some of those issues are. Yes. Uh, so the question is, you know, the contact center, uh, we have had some transitional, which we always have when you implement a contact center. There's transition problems, right, where a number stops working or, or you do get transferred, even though that's our goal not to do that. Uh, and uh, we've, we've had all those issues, all those hiccups. By and large, it's worked very well, and, and we have raving fans for that service, uh, which, is our, which is our goal, of course. I think uh, Steve, uh, Steve Sapp, the director of the Community Relations Department, that's part of his purview. What's the percentage of calls that are resolved, uh, first call? About 81% of our calls are resolved with uh, just one call, so we don't have to transfer anymore. And when we do transfer, we make sure that those are warm transfers. They're going from one person to another person. Now, it's not impossible to get voicemail, but uh, we try to keep that at an absolute minimum. So what we're hearing right now is uh, about 81% of the people that we deal with get their question or their problem uh, solved with just one call. So we're very proud of that. So uh, yeah, I, and I expect we'll have a few more hiccups before every number is, is over there, but uh, uh, hopefully the fewer and fewer as we move forward. Okay, well I want to thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time and uh, I know it can be a fairly dense, uh, unexciting document uh, and so uh, there'll be four more times to read it. But uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>